Now, Washington Mornings on the Mall. At AM 630. It is 837. Brian and Brian are with you here on WMAL, the place where Washington comes to talk. By the way, uh, Nemo got a text message from a friend of ours. Yes. Said they were at the lake down in uh, Mineral, Virginia. Uh Uh-huh. The earthquake hit last night. Oh, man. The quote was, woke me up and scared the crap out of me. (laughs) Glad she's okay. Glad she's okay. Uh, 837, uh, we have on the line right now Congressman uh, Michael Burgess, who is, uh, well, first of all, he's a member of Congress. Second of all, he comes from the great state of Texas, so you've got to like the guy right off the bat. Third, he is a, 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 a physician. And he, he serves on the uh, subcommittee. He's the chair of the subcommittee on health in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And uh, we thought it would be a good idea to have him on to talk about what everybody's going to be talking about for the balance of this week, and that is the arguments at the Supreme Court regarding Obamacare. Congressman, how are you today? Good morning. I'm Will. How are you all? Well, what do you think are the big issues at play here, and how do you think the court's going to come down? Well, the big issues there are defined by the four by the four areas where the court is going to look. And today's the the anti injunction clause has been keeping us most up most of the night, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the individual mandate on Tuesday, and severability and expansion of Medicaid on Wednesday. I think the big the big argument is the individual mandate on on Tuesday, uh, and it's tough. I think the You've had a split decision so far. My personal opinion is, of course, the individual mandate is unconstitutional under the Commerce Clause. I'm not sure that uh, that that will be the finding of the court, however. But it's a it's a critical piece to the whole law that we now know as the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. In your in your mind, what is the best case scenario? for Republicans or people who don't like this bill to happen out of the Supreme Court. What is the best-case scenario? And let's just say that they do rule it unconstitutional. What then happens after that? Well, the best-case scenario would be to affirm uh, Judge Roger Vinson, the federal district uh, judge, who about a year ago said the thing is unconstitutional and the entire law must be struck down. And that's not just good for Republicans, that's good for Americans because uh, this thing is going to kill a profession of medicine and is going to cost so much money there's no way in the world that we'll ever be able to pay for it. There are things that can be done. There are things that should have been done. Uh, look, I had up on my website, healthcaucus.org, uh, five or seven things that could have been done as insurance reforms that would have been small 70-page bills that would have fixed the existing problems. Uh, people talk about pre-existing conditions. Well, yeah, it's a big deal. But did it really take a $3 trillion bill and destroying the system in order to solve that problem? I don't think so. I think it was eminently soluble uh, without this thing that they did. And you just go down the line for the problems. They say, well, we fix this, we fix that. Uh, the donut hole, well, really. Mm. You've got the, you got Farmer to kick in some more money, but the, the law itself was absolutely unnecessary for, for what you did. And the problem is the law reaches so much further, and you go into all of the... All of the rules are being written by the, the agencies now, primarily held with human services. And it's a, it's an unbelievable expansion of federal government. All right, so if they go with Judge Vincent's uh, ruling, then what happens? It just goes away, it's completely void, and we're back to where we were uh, before the bill passed? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's obviously a tricky landscape, <clears throat> because there's been a lot of money spent and mm-hmm, a lot of sure. commitments, commitments made by the implementation. So it is going to take some care and some attention to unwind this thing, but I believe it is doable. It's, and as hard as it will be now, uh, or say July, if that's when the ruling comes down, as, as difficult as it will be to do that during an election year, it will be eminently more difficult to do it at some point in the future. So, so there's no time like the present in getting, getting busy on fixing the problems that this thing has, has brought to us. Our legal analyst, Joe DeGeneva, spent a, a few minutes trying to, you know, to help us understand the, the, the nuts and bolts of this case. But one of the things he, he seemed to think was pertinent to the arguments before the Supreme Court were sort of the unusual procedures that the Democrats followed to get the actual measure passed into law. Do you think that's an issue? You know, I think it's certainly interesting to me in the legislative branch the fact that the Senate picked up an unrelated House passed bill and turned it into a health bill. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting story, and and a lot of people have written about that, myself included. I, I don't know though if 
if that in and of itself would be enough to, to have it in front of the high court of the land and for the court to devote as much time to it as they have. But, um, again, we talked about the four parameters they're looking at. This thing that we that we worked on in Congress last week, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, which never should have been created, and the House has now re- re- repealed it, um, but this thing seems unconstitutional to me. It seems to violate Article One of the Constitution and take uh, take power away from the people and and give it to goodness knows who. But but certainly not. Uh, it's certainly no longer the, the the people in charge. Now, if the if the Supreme Court rules that the individual mandate is unconstitutional, but says the rest of the law can stay, what does that do? to this health care law i mean if you don't have the source the the money source to for the insurance companies which is one of the reasons why they were okay with it for the most part right um, what happens i mean how does it how is it paid for well of course the pay for is still going to come through taxes on the american people mm-hmm. but uh it, it is the, in my opinion the worst of all worlds to have right. that that happen because that's going to put some very serious strain and stress on the insurance companies who you correctly point out were in favor of this thing because it did contain the individual mandate. Now, if you can buy insurance whenever and wherever you want, uh, that is in the emergency room after your, after your accident, uh, it's going to become very, very expensive, which will lead more people to not buy insurance and then you get into the classic insurance death spiral. So could this be the backdoor way of getting the single-payer system that most of the Democrats wanted right. in the first place? It could be. It certainly could be. But it will, as I, as I said before, this will require even more attention and even more legislative work, again, having to be done in perhaps a very difficult and dicey election year summer politics. But we'll have to do it because the, right. the outcome then is absolutely critical. Congressman, am I correct you have endorsed Newt Gingrich in this presidential election? Yes, I have. Are you, sta- are, you standing, are you standing by him, and do you think he should stay into the bitter end? Well, the bitter end, but if the, uh, the speaker has you know, brings something to the debate, brings something to the campaign, and, and yes, of course I think he should stay in the race. What, what is the end game if he stays in? Well, right now I don't know if the arithmetic works for, for any candidate to have all uh, uh, 1,100 delegates that they need by the time of the convention. Look, I went to Newt Gingrich in the fall, in November of 2009, right after the House had passed its version of the health care law. And as far as I could tell, he was the only person who could stand on the stage with Barack Obama in the fall of 2012 and articulate a vision for where this country could go and and, and, and take us there. I mean, Newt Gingrich has that incredible ability to... Well, I, 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 I don't quibble with any of that, but my question is, what's the end game? What does he hope to get out of this? Because he's clearly not in... in the math is very difficult for him to get the, the number of delegates he needs. He has half of what Santorum has, and Santorum has about half of what uh, Mitt Romney has. The math is difficult, but uh, let's be honest, this has been an unusual election year, and I, again, I think the Speaker brings so much to the race, I want to see him stay. Okay. Yeah. Congressman Burch, great to have you on. Thanks as always. We appreciate it. Thank you.